My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. Now, not all economies were created equal. There are scavenger economies and predator economies. The national economies of the world can be divided to the scavenger and the predator types. The former, the scavenger ones, are parasitic economies, which feed off the latter, the predator economies. The relationship is often not that of symbiosis, where two parties maintain a mutually beneficial coexistence. Here, one economy feeds off other economies in a way which is harmful, even detrimental to the hosts. But this interaction, however undesirable, is the only hope. The typology of scavenger economies reveals their sources of sustenance. Let's start with the conjunctural economy. These economies feed off historical or economic conjunctures or crises. They position themselves as a bridge between warring or conflicting parties. Switzerland rendered this service to Nazi Germany, North Macedonia and Greece to Serbia, Cyprus and Serbia aided and abetted Russia, Jordan helped Iraq, and Montenegro acted the part for both Serbia and Kosovo. These economies consist of smuggling, siege breaking, contraband, sanctions busting, arms trade, and illegal immigration. They benefit economically by violating both international and domestic laws and by providing international outcasts and rogues with alternative routes of supply and with goods and services. <clears throat> this is a close cousin, a first cousin of criminal economies. Criminal economies are economies which are infiltrated and hijacked by criminal gangs, kleptocracies, or suffused with criminal behavior. Such infiltration is two-phased, the properly criminal phase and the money laundering one. In the first phase, criminal activities yield income and result in, wage formation, in wealth formation and accumulation. In the second phase, the money thus generated in the first phase is laundered and legitimized. It is invested in legal, above-board activities. The economy of the United States during the 19th century and in the years of prohibition was partly criminal. It is reminiscent of the Russian economy, permeated as it is by criminal conduct. Russians often compare their stage of capitalist evolution to the United States' Wild West. Another type of economy is the piggyback service economy. These are economies which provide predator economies with services. These services are aimed at re-establishing economic equilibrium in the host predator economies. Tax shelters are a fine example of this variety. In many countries, taxes are way too high and they result in the misallocation of economic resources. Tax shelters and tax havens offer a way of re-establishing the economic balance and reinstating a regime of efficient allocation, or more efficient allocation, of resources. These economies could be regarded as external appendages, shock absorbers, and regulators of their host economies. They feed off market failures, market imbalances, arbitrage opportunities, shortages, and inefficiencies. Many post-communist countries and polities in South and Central America and Asia have made the provision of such services a part of their economic life. Free zones, offshore havens, offshore banking and transshipment ports proliferate from Panama to Arkhangelsk. The next type of economy is the aid economy. Economies that derive most of their vitality from aid, international aid, granted them by donor countries, multilateral aid agencies and NGOs. Many of the economies in transition belong to this class. Up to 50%, 15% of their GDP is in the form of handouts, soft loans and technical assistance. Another 15-30% to 30 are comprised of remit remittances. Rescheduling is another species of financial subsidy and virtually all developing countries 
have benefited from it. The dependence thus formed can easily deteriorate into addiction. The economic players in such economies engage mostly in lobbying and in political maneuvering rather than in actual production. The next type of economy is the derivative or satellite economy. These are economies which are absolutely dependent upon or very closely correlated with other economies. This is either because they conduct most of their trade with these economies or because they are marginal, a, a marginal member of a powerful regional club or aspire to become one, or because they are under the economic or geopolitical or military umbrella of a, religion, of a re regional power or a superpower. Another variant is the single commodity or single goods or single service economies. Many countries in Africa and many members of the OPEC oil cartel rely on a single product for their livelihood. Russia, for instance, is heavily dependent on proceeds from the sale of its energy products. Most Montenegrins derive their livelihood directly or indirectly from smuggling, bootlegging and illegal immigration. Drugs are a major export earner in Albania, Afghanistan and Thailand, to mention only three of many dozens. Copycat economies are economies that are based on legal or more often illegal copying and emulation of intellectual property, patents, brand names, designs, industrial processes, other forms of innovation, copyrighted material, etc. The prime examples are Japan and China, which constructed their entire mega economies on these bases. Both Bulgaria and Russia are meccas of piracy. Though prosperous for a time, these economies are dependent on and subject to the vicissitudes of business cycles. They are capital sensitive, inherently unstable, and with no real long-term prospects if they fail to generate their own intellectual property. They reflect the volatility of the markets for their goods and are overly exposed to trade risks, international legislation, asset bubbles and imports. Usually they specialize in narrow segments of manufacturing, which only increases the precariousness of their situation. The nosology of predatory economies includes generators of intellectual property. These are economies that encourage and emphasize innovation and progress. They reward innovators, entrepreneurs, nonconformism and conflict. They spew out patents, designs, brands, copyrighted material and other forms of packaged human creativity. They derive most of their income from licensing and royalties and constitute one of the engines driving globalization. And still, these economies, the generators of intellectual property, are too poor to support the complementary manufacturing and marketing activities. Their natural counterparts are the industrial bases. Within the former Eastern Bloc, Poland, Russia, Hungary and Slovenia are to a limited extent such generators. Israel is such an economy in the Middle East. And then there are the industrial bases. These are powerhouse economies that make use of the intellectual property generated by the former type within industrial processes. These economies do not copy the intellectual property as it is, rather they add to it important elements of adaptation to niche markets, image creation, market positioning, advertising, packaging, technical literature, combining it with other products or services, designing and implementing the whole production process, market demand creation, improvement upon the original and other value-added services. These contributions are so extensive that the end products or services can no longer be identified with the original, which serve as mere triggers, if you wish. Again, Poland, Hungary, Slovenia, and to a lesser extent Croatia uh, come to mind. Of course, the United States and others. Consumer-oriented economies. This is our third wave, Alvin Toffler's uh, term, third wave services, information, and knowledge-driven economies. The overriding set of values is consumer-oriented. Wealth formation and accumulation are secondary. The primary activities are concerned with fostering markets, and maintaining them. These weightless economies concentrate on the value added by intangibles 
advertising, packaging, marketing, sales promotion, education, entertainment, servicing, dissemination of information, knowledge formation, trading, um, trading in symbolic assets, mainly financial, spiritual pursuits, and other economic activities which enhance the consumer's welfare, pharmaceuticals, for instance. These economies are also likely to spot a largish, largish public sector, most of it service oriented. No emerging or developing economy qualifies as consumer oriented, though there are pockets of consumer oriented entrepreneurship within each one. We come to the trader economies. These economies are equivalent to the cardiovascular system. They provide the channels and transmission mechanisms through which goods and services are exchanged. They do this by trading or by assuming risks, by providing physical transportation and telecommunications, and by maintaining an appropriately educated manpower to support all these activities. These economies are highly dependent on the general health of international trade in the global economy. Many Central East European economies are trader economies. The openness ratio, trade divided by GDP, of most CEE countries is higher than the G countries' openness ratio, G7 countries' openness ratio. So they are much more open to trade. These are the official figures. A lot of trade goes unreported in the grey, black and informal sectors. So the openness is probably much higher. Additionally, these states have one low-weighted custom rate. And openness to trade is an official policy actively pursued. These economies are predatory in the sense that they engage in zero-sum gains. A contract signed or gained by a Slovenian company is a contract lost by a Croatian one. Luckily, in the past few, uh, shall we say, decades, the global economic cake tended to grow and the sum of zero-sum gains amounted to more welfare for everyone involved. These vibrant economies, the hopes of benighted and blighted regions, are justly described as engines because they pull all other, other, all other scavenger economies with them. They're not likely to do so forever, however. Still, until recently, most governments have assimilated the lessons of the 1930s. Protectionism is bad for everyone involved, especially for economic engines. Openness to trade, protection of property rights and functioning institutions increase both the number and the scope of markets. The only discordant note is the United States, where the likes of Donald Trump are threatening to upset the entire apple cart.